Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We'll wait uh, one minute more for participants to join to the event. And then we'll uh, start. Hello everyone who are joining the event. Good afternoon, Marco. Welcome. It's Marcelo here. Greetings uh, from our side uh, to begin the event with uh, our colleague here, uh, Marco. We are all set. Greetings. Thank you. Uh, we invite everyone to uh, turn off their microphones while we do the presentation and we'll start the event. Hello everyone, I would like to welcome you all to uh, tonight's webinar, Canada's Toxic Legacy, Pan American Silver and Mining Billionaire Rosbitti in Latin America. We are very, very pleased for everyone's participation today. This event is a collective effort of many organizations which we would like to thank for their support in making this event happen. You can see their names on the slide right now, on the right-hand side. Tonight's conversation will be in Spanish with simultaneous interpretation to English. During the second hour, there will be a presentation in Portuguese with simultaneous interpretation in Spanish. For those requiring interpretation, to access interpretation at the bottom of your screen, there is an icon of the world, a planet that says interpretation. Please click on the language that you would like to hear and know that you can mute the original audio if you want. So. My name is uh, Jen Moore. I work from Mexico with the Mining and Trade Project of the Institute for Policy Studies, which is based in Washington, DC. And here in Mexico, I collaborate with the Mexican network of, of affected people by mining. I will be moderating the first hour of the event. And during the second hour, Viviana Herrera, Latin American Program Coordinator for Mining Watch Canada will be the moderator for the second part. You can ask uh, questions to the panelists at any time during the event using the Zoom chat or the Facebook chat, or as well as through the Q&A option that you can find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will be reviewing the questions and, do, and doing two rounds of Q&As at the end of the first hour, and then at the end of the second hour. In addition, after the event, 
will be sharing by email with everyone who registered for the event, what was presented today, and information how, about how you can take action. Before beginning, we would like to extend our thanks to our interpreters, Pierre-Yves, Patricia, and Eline, who are helping us with interpretation during the whole event, and to Edno and Nico of the Network in Solidarity with the People of Guatemala, the Guatemala, Nisgua, for their technical support throughout the event. We also want to make a collective recognition, especially for those of us who come or are present today from different parts of the colonial states of Canada and the United States, that we are living on occupied and stolen indigenous land. Further, we recognize that processes of colonial dispossession persist throughout the hemisphere, especially through activities such as extractive activities. Let's honor with gratitude the people who have cared and stewarded for and defended lands and territories for generations and, con and continue to do so, north and south. We share a link in the chat of a project started to uh, start knowing the, ter the territory where you are now, if you don't know it yet. Now, I would like to share a little bit about what brings us today, which is about the wide range of harms associated with mining activity throughout Latin America and not just linked to Canadian mining companies. However, uh, Canada has a great responsibility uh, in facilitating mining in all over the region. In particular, we, we will focus on what has been happening around the mining operations and exploration projects of a group of Canadian companies that share something in common which is the involvement of a multi-billionaire Canadian investor by the name of Ross Beatty. In the first hour of this event, we will hear about the environmental and social impacts of Pan American Silver Company, which Ross Beatty founded in 1994, and which now operates in five Latin American countries. Tomorrow is Pan American Silver's annual shareholder meeting, where and when Ross Beatty will retire from his position at the helm of the company's board of directors. In the second hour, we'll hear about conflicts surrounding Equinox Gold, which Ross Beatty says would be his last play as an entrepreneur, and Solaris, where Equinox and Ross Beatty also have a large financial interest. We have invited you to learn about the background of this group of companies because they have projected a good image, especially in, in Canada, when the truth is that they continue to reproduce the patterns that we see with so many mining companies of generating division and social conflicts to impose their interests, in addition to large irreparable environmental and social impacts in a context of impunity. In addition, we do it to join efforts and continue building solidarity with the communities and organizations that today will share with us what they are living and facing and fighting with dignity from various parts of the region. At the end of each hour during the event, we will be sharing information on how you can take action. So to start, uh, the event, I will introduce, introduce you our first round of panel, panelists from four points in Latin America in order, Peru, Argentina, Guatemala, and Mexico. It is worth mentioning that we will keep the names of those who are participating from Mexico confidential during the event for secu security reasons. Each pa panelist will have 10 minutes to share about their experience, and I will let uh, uh, no to all speakers when they reach nine minutes so they can conclude. I also remind you, uh, all the panelists, that it will help a lot our interpreters if you don't talk too fast. To kick off this first hour of our event, let's hear about the first mining project purchased by Pan American Silver since Ross Beasy founded the company in 1994. Uh, we're talking here about the Kiruvilka mine located in the Libertad region of Northwestern Peru, 
which uh, was a flagship of Pan American Silvers, and it operated between 1995 and 2012. Kirul Vilka left behind a legacy of environmental devastation and contamination that continues to this day. From Lima, Peru, journalist Paul Maquet, a member of the Cooperation team, will share with us about this legacy that continues to be a great threat and risk for the living beings around it. So uh, the floor is yours, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. Good night. And good afternoon to all the audience. Thank you so much for the invitation, for participating in this space. I'm Paul Marquette. I'm part of the, uh, an institution called uh, Interaction and, and works on uh, mining uh, operations, especially in indigenous land in Peru. And to uh, present the case of Kirul Vika, which is a deeply um, problematic case in Peru, I will share with you uh, an extract of video to start with. And I will share it with you. We're not hearing the audio. Edna, if you can uh, rewind a bit because we're not uh, uh, listening to the audio. We'll try to resolve and picking in again the video. The authorities act as if nothing was happening. They are noxious, one-eyed, and they turn a, a deaf ear. These are exclusive images that show how, in the most blatant way, the Kiribelka mine is contaminating the headwaters of the Moche River Basin. Now we're listening to uh, the video, but we're not seeing it. The authorities act as if nothing was happening. They are noxious, one-eyed, and they turn a deaf ear. These are exclusive images that show how, in the most blatant way, the Kurivilka mine is contaminating the headwaters of the Moche River Basin. Inhabitants of the area and members of the peasant patrols express their concern about the situation which they say is totally unacceptable. This entire operation and its tailings are inside the headwaters of this river basin. We have lived this situation for decades and we are also concerned about the situation of the authorities who so far have said nothing about this company and how it works in a very irresponsible manner. In certain areas, for example, in the higher areas, which are elevated in terms of metals, we have cadmium, arsenic, in the, video, in the video, you can see how the mine tailings are thrown into this lagoon that then flows, according to the residents, in the headwaters of the Moche River Basin. It reaches the crops of more than 10,000 farmers from Santiago de Chuco to Laredo. Thank you so much. And that's great uh, that we were able to see uh, and listen to the audio. 
Those are testimonies from uh, peasants in the zones uh, in the face of contamination and pollution. And I would like to share with my uh, PowerPoint presentation what's the current situation. Very good. So let's start uh, in the case of Pan American silver and uh, its mine in Kuruvilka, we see a recent picture of the state of the waters in the Mocha River. Let's go to the next slide, please. The Kuruvilka mine is a mid sized project. Uh, of uh, subterraneous uh, metals. Uh, it was exploited during 17 years by a uh, mining company uh, from Canada, Pan American Silver. And since 1995 until 2012, in the year it was uh, sold to Southern Peaks Mining, and who has owned the mine until 2015. And it was eventually sold to a citizen, an individual entrepreneur who uh, finally declared it uh, bankrupt and left the country and uh, without paying uh, the workers with a debt towards workers uh, of uh, $10 million with 428 uh, workers and abandoned all the operation without uh, implementing uh, the uh, closing plan. Next slide, please. The mine is lo located in the headwaters uh, of the Rio Mache Cuenca, which is in the north uh, eastern part of Peru. And it really had the cr cross point of three important rivers, the Viru, uh, the Santa and Moche, uh, that are located at 3,900 uh, meters over the sea, the level of the sea. You can see here its location in the map to give you uh, uh, an idea, it's a northern west uh, coast of Peru. Here we can see it's uh, a zone that's uh, very um, invaded by uh, many mining concessions. And that's uh, in the uh, green circle, you can see where is located the Kiruvilka mine. And this is in more detail, the different operations, mining operations in the zones. There's a Kuruvolka, uh, all the little dots that you can see are all extractive projects uh, currently uh, being implemented. And um, what we've seen in the video, you can see the river uh, uh, and the Moche River that's been contaminated by those mining activities. In this case, uh, we've declared uh, by the official officers of the state as an uh, environment emergency in 2018. The state has declared a state of emergency because of the imminent uh, danger generated by the possible um, overflow of the river and its impact tailings uh, that would impact the whole zone. The tailings of the abandoned mine uh, is uh, drained uh, towards two uh, small rivers, the La Merced in Santa Calina, and also the Shore uh, Rio, which are all confluents to the Moche River. So here you can see in the screen uh, the green uh, mines that are being abandoned and there are different uh, confluents of the river that you can see in that map that uh, goes towards the city of Trujillo, which is a quite important city in the country. The official reports of the National Authority on Water uh, found the concentration of aluminum, arsenic, cadmium, uh, copper, uh, and manganese, and, and many other um, substances uh, that have an impact directly on the water quality and there's no, uh, there's a deterioration of uh, uh, represent uh, a danger if there's an overflow of the river or rupture uh, in the case of intense uh, rainfalls and that we've uh, been observing over the past few years. 
60,000 hectares of farming are in risk in the Libertad zone. Next, please. How did we came to this? This is the history of 17 years of irresponsible business activity. Pan American silver exploded the mine among 1995 and 2012. And even that we don't have official information about the initial period uh, since 2000. The state of Peru started to build independent environmental authorities with the capacity of monitoring mining activities. We found that in that period, Kiribilka registered 13 sanctions because of polluting the water. And after complaints from the company, a uh, few of them started to uh, end up being like fines because of tiling. Here we can see the list of sanctions, of effective sanctions that the company received in the period that was uh, in charge of Pan American Silver. Almost every year there was at least one sanction and in some cases more than one what uh, talks about the responsibility of this company operations at the end of the of the life of the mine when it was closed the time of assuming the costs of closing the mining activity pan american uh, sells the this mine to other uh, companies, Southern Peaks Mining. And at the time, the executive director uh, declared that the mine was uh, able to operate the mine in a responsible way, but that didn't happen. After that, also Southern Peaks received uh, several sanctions from regulation organisms and in 2015 also southern pinks sold the the mine to a small businessman that abandoned it in a totally irresponsible way since then without any plan of closing the mine being implemented the acid waters from tiling were left after 17 years of operation of Pan American and three years of operation of Southern Weeks. And these tilings continue flowing to the basin of Mocha River. And who pays the price of this environmental disaster? In the first place, the population that is exposed to consume this water and polluted uh, food, and the state that needs to pay millions for the to improve the actions of these companies. This company have other investments and projects in the country. Pan American Silver owns 282 mines, uh, about 500 hectares at the national level. The mining company, Compañía Minera Guarón, also have other sections sanctions because of the, uh, that is also in charge of Pan American Silver. Also, you can see here the list of sanctions of this second company. Most of the infractions are exceeding the, lim the top limits uh, of pollutants in the waters, uh, mining tilings, environmental emergency, all these are from the one on unit. Next, please. Please, we are in nine minutes, Paul. Thank you. We ask ourselves if the economic benefits of uh, mining exploitation really can compensate the costs of the environmental impact, the systemic environmental impact that are generated. The benefits go away, but the impacts probably are forever because we have thousands of tons of toxic waste in our waters, polluting our waters, and maybe this problem would not be solved for hundreds of years. 
these companies not only should receive sanctions and fines, but also they should be prohibited to continue exploitation other mines because of the risk that they generate to the population. In this case, a company with that history has more projects in other parts of the country exposing other populations to this pollution. Next, please. I think we are, I'm finishing. Thank you very much for your interest in the Kirovilka case, which is one of the environmental tragedies, more one of the most dramatic environmental tragedies in Peru. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we will have more time uh, after hearing several other situations generated by Pan American Silver to talk a little more about what Paul uh, just said about this environmental disaster. Now we are going to give the floor to Ivan Pailalaf, member of the Mapuche Tehuelche community, Laguna Fria Chacay Oeste, and of the Union of Assemblies of Chubut Communities. He was born and raised in his community. Ivan began to get involved in the struggle for water and territory, accompanying his grandmother, father. And after learning about the consequences that the Navidad project would have on the territory they live in. He's currently studying history at the National University of the Patagonia, San Juan Bosco, in the city of Trileo Chubut. We are very grateful that Ivan is with us today to share about the long struggle in Chubut that achieved the ban of mining in the entire province in 2003. And now is fighting very hard to ensure that mining companies like, like Pan American Silver stay out of his territory. Ivan? Thank you very much to everyone for this space and for being here today. As Jen said, here in Chubut, we have a law that bans the, the mining exploitation. However, other activities as, as prospection, mining prospection are not forbidden. Uh, therefore, the companies enter to our territory. In that stage, the most advanced one is the Pan American company, Pan American Silver in Navidad Project, which is in the Northern Plateau where my community lives. And there are more the 10 communities in the Welche, the Welche Mapuche communities more and other populations. This intermission from the Pan American Silver Company started in 2009 when the company bought the Navidad project to extract silver, copper, and plumbus. They know that for this project, there never were uh, asked for previous free consent to the communities in the territories. Uh, the mega mining has not any permits or social license in the community by the community in Chubut, but has been reflected by a large amount of uh, protests made by the Mapuche peoples in the last years. And they increased in the last two years because of two reasons. First, because from the provincial and national government, uh, they are promoting to pass a law to allow that in a part of the province, uh, the mining will uh, to be allowed. And specifically in this Northern Plateau where the Navidad project is pretended to be installed. We are starting a struggle to ban the metal mining in all the stages with the use of any pollutant substances, also uranium mining. So to, and also to remediate all the harms made by the mining companies to the date. We presented a law project through popular initiative, which is a semi 
direct uh, mechanism that allows to the people to propose a, a law project if they get enough uh, signs from, from the population. We gathered uh, the double of the amount uh, requested by the constitution. We gathered more than 30,000 signs last year. What, however, last week, uh, the government rejected this uh, law project by, uh, because the, uh, by declaring it as constitutional. And those arguments were promoted through a lobby company financed by, a, by the mega mining company, Pan American Silver. While I'm speaking, you are seeing some pictures of people from the central Northern Plateau that is expressing and have been uh, talking against mega mining because part of the campaign of mega mining is saying that, the, that no one lives in the plateau and hiding our voices, our feelings, attacking our rights as inhabitants of the plateau and as indigenous peoples, they are trying to do this. This is not only an attack to freedom of speech, but also to the possibility of the people from Tibet and the population to get informed of the about the reality of the communities in the plateau, which is already bad without mining, but might be even worse with the mining project. Recently, the communities of the plateau uh, communicated that uh, they were rejecting this uh, law project pro that promotes mega mining. And they were mentioned, one of the most important uh, impacts of mining that was lack of water because the mining companies, they used enormous amounts of water without asking for consent to the population. Pan American Silver last year asked again for permission to use the water in the plateau without asking uh, the consent of the Tehuelchema Piochi community. They only ask permission to the governmental agencies. So all the, through all this process, the companies had total impunity because from no uh, governmental agency, it was asked for any explanation to the company. Even when people go out to talk, to talk about uh, these uh, harms that we are suffering, we are being hiding and we are being invisibilized, which is something that the Argentinian government is being with the Tehuelche Mapuche communities for more than a hundred years. The Pan American silver generated a lot of corruption in our province with lots of uh, bribes uh, to uh, legislators and other uh, governmental agencies. And some of them trying to be proved, but justice was blind to those proofs of bribes. And that made that us, as the Welch Mapuche communities uh, have any confidence in our representatives, in our uh, in our governor and any or of other legislators, because we know that they are totally sold to the mining company. Also, other of the serious situations that we are living in Chubut we who defend our water and our territory is the criminalization of protests and the, viol the, 
the institutional violence. We have been suffered for the last, last few years, different situations of repression from the police that currently is uh, led by Federico Massoni, where uh, people from the assemblies and from the Mapuche towards the property have been violated in their integrity, physical integrity, and also uh, through legal mechanisms. All this that they are carrying out is to frighten us, to make us stop fighting, and to allow the company to get into the territory and continue exploiting the resources. But we know that we are an informed community and we will not allow the mining companies to continue going inside our territories. So the only way to impose that to us is making us suffer hunger. Uh, we are suffering a situation in the past years that professors, uh, decisions are not being paid by the government because uh, they are offering uh, mega mining as the only viable solution of having certain economic success. But we know that they are not generating work for the people and they will not leave anything to the country because in Argentina, the laws are very beneficial to the companies, but don't leave anything to the state or to the country. You, you're in a minute. Well, uh, I only would like to say that the Mapuche Tehuelche community will continue resisting and we will continue fighting against the force of the owners of the territory of other people that are in the territory and that we are tired of the vulneration of our rights that come from the provincial and national state and we demand to be treated seriously our popular initiative and to sanction to the companies and to the state for not respecting the Tehuelche Mapuche communities rights and to carry out uh, the asking for permission and for informed consent and that the mining companies go out to our territory because two good people defend their water and their territory thank you very much from my heart thank you very much to ivan for sharing about this long fight uh, and the tenacity of the people to defend their self-determination and decision of not allowing mega mining in Chubut and in the, in the plateau. Just a reminder to those that are hearing the event, if you have any questions, you can ask them using the Q and A box for questions and answers that you can find at the end, uh, at the bottom of your screen. We would love to receive your question to make a question and answers round with our panelists. To finish the presentation from Guatemala. So now, well, invite uh, and gives me a great pleasure now to introduce uh, Blanca Oliva, who belongs to the La Cuchilla community, a community set above the two knolls of Pan American Silver's Escobar Silver Mine. And that community has suffered firsthand from the company's human rights violations. Blanca is participating in our event this afternoon tonight on behalf of the Xinka Parliament of Guatemala, the Xinka people and the peaceful resistance of Santa Rosa, Jalapa and Juliapa 
have sustained a struggle against mining in the territory in southern Guatemala for more than 10 years. Since mid 2017, Pan American Silver's Escobar mine has been suspended due to permanent sit ins by the population and a court order mandating the Ministry of Energy and Mines to carry out the consultation under Convention 169 of the International Labour Organization. And also the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples with the Shinka people. It's notable that Pan American Silver purchased the Escobar project in 2019 during the full suspension of the mine and in the face of the evident rejection of mining in this region of Guatemala. So I give uh, the floor to Blanca. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for the invitation. For us, uh, definitely, uh, there's no uh, social responsibility and accountability uh, to the company and uh, there have been uh, many signals of uh, violation of human rights in our territory on june 30 in 2019 throughout the press release it's been recognized that uh, since 2013 the director of the company of security for the company ordered uh, a shutout against uh, some of our comrades in the protest. At least six uh, comrades uh, were injured and uh, one of them with uh, grave injuries. In the face of this and this situation, uh, the very least they uh, care about is uh, social responsibility and uh, have an impact on the community. The only thing that uh, really they care about is money, profit. They don't really care if they murder or have uh, impact on the communities. The only thing they care about is making money uh, against the sufferings of the communities. For us, the mining company only changed uh, its name since uh, 2013. It was announced uh, 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 a process of pre-consultation. Uh, the mining company uh, uh, started again uh, an attack against the communities. Uh, uh, there was uh, an attempt uh, of uh, a killing uh, against one of our leading comrades and they generate uh, terror among the communities and to our authorities since uh, the beginning uh, of our battle and uh, the community uh, blocked the company's operation. The, the strategy was to criminalize the protest, uh, attacked us, uh, made some killings of our leaders. Uh, there was a sentence in the court that, that confirms the suspension of the mining project. Until, until the free prior and informed consent would be achieved. Uh, but since uh, 2020, uh, there are still attacks against the community uh, and, and the mining operation are still going on in a clandestine manner. Uh, in the process of that uh, consultation, again, we observed uh, many provocation attacks uh, to implement uh, forcibly the mining project. They started to offer work and jobs to uh, people. They want to buy people, bribe them in order to manip manipulate the consultation. Uh, they're uh, working very hard to divide and create division among uh, the community. Like I just said, the, the key issue here is uh, communization that was raised since uh, last year until today. What we're going through our facing is, is really reminds us what we lived and went through in 2013. And the state is uh, an accomplice in all this and uh, 
uh, declared a state of emergency to uh, favor the implementation of the mining operations. Uh, but that doesn't uh, stop us to keep working for the community and stopping and blocking the project. Many uh, of our uh, community members had to uh, go away, leave out of the terror that was imposed in the, ter in the territory to find a living. It's, of it's obvious that uh, this effort to uh, create a division among communities is successful. And what do we do uh, to face all this? Uh, thanks to the sentence, we are requesting that uh, we should respect the principle of goodwill and uh, guarantee a fair consultation process and guarantee uh, a participation, active participation of our representatives and community leaders. In the face of the consultation process, it's obvious throughout the past two years that the consultation is biased. There's a bias to, to, to it. It's a vicious uh, strategy to implement a false consultation. We are requesting strongly by the community that there should be a goodwill to implement a fair and free and informed consultation to the communities and to take into account uh, our position as communities in defense of our human rights and our land and territory. Thank you so much, Ranka, for sharing this situation with us. I would like to remind all the audience, uh, we uh, would like and call upon your questions. Uh, uh, if you are listening from on the Facebook plug, book, uh, Facebook platform, you can uh, use the chat in Facebook to drop your questions. And also the ones uh, that are participating through Zoom can use the Q&A option of the Zoom module. And we'll uh, make sure to uh, gather those questions and uh, invite our panelists to respond. We are going to, uh, uh, we are now going to our next panelist, uh, just like uh, a situation similar to what have been uh, gone through by uh, the community of Blanca. So we'll end this first round of presentation on the precedents and conflicts and allegations surrounding Pan American service operations with the testimonies and experiences from the La Colorada community in Zacatecas, Mexico. The La Colorada community was forcibly displaced by Pan American Silver in early 2017 to facilitate the expansion of the mine of the same name. The company began operating the La Colorada mine in 2004, and today it is one of their largest mines. Uh, this, uh, uh, this testimony is based uh, by an investigation and research that was led by the Mexican uh, network on affected uh, by mining in Mexico, the REMA network. Uh, and we uh, recorded uh, uh, their intervention in the video, we'll share it. And then uh, the REMA representative are here to respond to your questions. So let's share the video. Well, uh, our community was a free, happy, peaceful community dedicated to agriculture and cattle raising and livestock on a small scale. But it was enough for the subsistence of the community. So the work that was done in the community, agriculture, cattle raising, was enough to maintain the community as it was. The activities carried out by the community were enough to have a fulfilled life as it was transmitted to us, as we wanted to continue transmitting to the next generations. Because it was a free, full, happy, calm, and peaceful life. And we had enough to live in harmony and nothing else was taken away. Let me share with you how we were displaced. It, first of all, a great injustice because we were threatened and forced to abandon our homes, our belongings, our 
patrimony. We were threatened in a way that threatened our own lives and those of our families. We were also threatened at the government palace where we were told that the company was asking and requesting a document stipulating that the con company was not responsible for anything that happened to us, washing away also the government's uh, responsibility. They called us to join some talks, but we did not want to discuss anything or negotiate the destruction they wanted to commit. So the company requested that document and the state government was going to give it to them. And why do I mention the state government? Because it, it is the way the company operates, approaching the government, asking to leave the people unprotected, forcing them to leave them, leave under the threats that the communities receive from the companies. That's what happened to us. Our community had to abandon its belongings and patrimony because of the fear the, that our families and our families would suffer more damages. The Plata Panamericana company was the one that destroyed our homes, bringing their own workers, uniformed and armed security guards who constantly came in at all hours, threatening the community, taking pictures of us, monitoring what we were doing, leaving us with no space for ourselves, eventually forcing us to leave our houses, our homes. It's worth highlighting that the community did not have any knowledge of how to defend uh, ourselves from these actions. We didn't know what to do. We were afraid. We were not receiving any support from anywhere or any institution or combined with the fact that the state government was in favor of the company. And we were forced to abandon our patrimony out of fear. While on the other hand, the company kept saying on many stages that it works hand in hand with the communities that they grow with, they grow and operate while supporting local people, that everyone is part of a big family. The truth is that it makes us angry. We feel powerless and sad to see how the company with its narrative looks into convincing other people what is not the truth. What's the reality? Everything that the company has been taking from us, our patrimony, our homes, our way of life, everything was taken from us. And it makes us sad to see how, through their narratives, the companies cover up what in reality they are doing to the communities, like it happened to us, that they take away all forms of life and dispossess them. They displace them from their lands, from their homes, and from all the way of life to which the communities are accustomed to. So we feel a rage, powerlessness and anger when we hear their lies. It is very difficult to support this and, and not cry, not to shout, not how the things we feel. It is very complicated and it is very difficult for all of us to feel when we see all their and hear all their lies. And so the change in the community was total because uh, every form of life was taken away from us. All the life we were used to, to was taken away from us. The peace, the tranquility was taken away from us because now we have nothing. We have no intimacy, we have no peace. We have no way of life because the one we are used to no longer exists. It was taken away from us. If before we had a hen to give us an egg, to give us a broth, now we have no lo longer have any. And if we, we, we used to have a cow to give us milk, now no more. If we used to have a pig leg that we ate almost always two or three times a year, now we don't have that either. If we had a vegetable garden, from which we got fruit, vegetables, whatever little we could get, but it was ours, now we don't have it anymore. It's over because of the company's doings. They say that an, 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 an animal pollutes more than their barracks that they build, where we are being displaced and where people are parked. Well, it is no longer a way of life to which the community is accustomed, the rural people because we are peasants and there's no longer a way of life offered to us. 
And, and as for the demands of the community, there will be many because from one day to the next, they no longer had anything, no longer had a way of life, no longer had patrimony belongings, no longer have tranquility, no longer have peace. So the demands will be many for all the, first of all, justice for everything has been taken away from us, from, for all the violations of human rights, for all the life that is being taken away from us and respect because they should respect the community. They should respect the way of life, our way of life, because they are no one to come and take everything from, from us, from everything you, we have built, everything we have fought for. They are nobody to come here and take everything from us because just because they say so. They are no one to take from you, nor no one to violate your rights, no one to dispossess you, no one to displace you from your lands because those lands are ours. They have no rights to come and take all this away from from us. They have no right. And recognition also that they should recognize that they are doing wrong, that they cause damage and they recognize their doings. They should recognize that the community is being devastated by their actions. What we really want deeply is respect for the communities, for their life, their way of life, their way of expressing themselves, their customs and traditions, because this is part of the community. And if they are not willing to respect the people, the families of the communities, the communities that they devastate, well, they should just leave. They should never come. They, they, sh they should never come to this drug, this possess, this place. They sh should let the communities live in peace, in harmony, as they are accustomed to. With the little or with the much that they have, the communities are happy because they have freedom. Unfortunately, this is what happened to us. And now we live in uncertainty because in the community where we are because of the contamination, the pollution, no longer do we have a form of life, the one we were used to, there is no life, no future. We are constantly exposed to pollution that we do not know in the short or long term how it will affect us. What will happen to us tomorrow? Will our children get sick? We don't know what we are exposed to. We know that we are permanently, permanently at risk because they keep us at a short distance, poisoning us day after day. We don't know what will happen or whereabouts. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, testimony and also for everyone's participation in this first block of the event. We will con uh, conclude. Uh, if you can help me uh, showing the next uh, slide, please. Um, we would like to uh, invite you to everyone that is listening to us uh, through Zoom or through Facebook that you uh, uh, help us in sharing through uh, uh, social media, uh, send messages to the person who will be replacing Ross BC as chairman of the board of Pan American Silver tomorrow, Gillian Winkler. We have prepared a series of messages and tweets that we are going to pass out via chat now and an email to people who signed up for Zoom that you can use to send to send her and the company about the four project we just heard about. The idea is to remind her and the company about Pan American Silver's outstanding debt to Latin American communities and the demands from various territories where it has been operating. We will be uh, sharing at the end of uh, the second hour, we will share more information on how you can take action uh, on uh, Equinox Gold and Solaris. So now we'll, uh, we'll give uh, some time for uh, a round of questions and answers uh, uh, of what we've uh, uh, received so far from the people that are listening to us. First of all, I would like to ask Ivan, if you can open your microphone, there is a question about 
uh, what's uh, what's how much strong are the consultations in Argentina and if they are binding? Yeah, uh, if there are consultation and if they are binding, at least in Chubut province in Argentina, not, they are not. Uh, there never have been a process of previous and informed consultation has, as it should be respecting international standards uh, for mining activities extracted activities or for any other activities affecting indigenous communities. Even when it is a recognized right, the communities are not regulated as it should be, especially in this uh, province, there's not a protocol of previous free consent. So to have an effective consultation, there are several requirements. Uh, that should be in a protocol considered by the communities. So it should is, exist before continue with the next step. And without this consent, uh, the company shouldn't be present because the lack of the legal framework. And that's why it's necessary to the company to be out of our territories because the consultation should be free of any external pressure and since the company is present and make an influence in the media and in the governments they don't allow us or or assure us uh, independence and freedom a lot of information is hidden about the activities that are being made in the communities in the territories and also uh, in a hidden way with the governmental uh, agents. And there are a lot of lies about their communities and all the information is not uh, available for the communities. So consultation here in Argentina, at least in Chubut province is not uh, binding. And therefore it should be binding. But as I say, as I'm saying, there's a huge lack of legal framework to carry out this consultation process. That's why, uh, well, we cannot say that they are binding because there is a lack, a huge gap to get there. And there is not willing from the government to do that. And of course, even with this gap, uh, there is uh, no, uh, the company shouldn't be allowed to be here because there are a lot of processes that should be implemented. Because if not, uh, happens the things that are suffering that we are suffering right now, that we are suffering threats, attacks, violence against our territories and our bodies, and this cannot continue like this. If we really want a democratic intercultural society that respects human rights, it cannot continue like this. I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much, Ivan. I have also a question for Blanca. Can you talk about a little about the role of uh, international solidarity to help with to help you with your fight to uh, avoid that? Escobar mine start their operations, start to operate. Well, uh, the international institutions are very important for us as a community because uh, through them, our voices as peasants are listened as a way of saying. That's uh, my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Blanca. Also, there is a question for La Colorada community. And uh, maybe we can hear from Rema the answer about how do you think that Canada people can contract their narrative of Pan American silver, creating their good relations with the community. Are there 
falsehoods about Pan Americans' relationship with the community being spread in Mexico, or is more something that is happening in Canada? Oh, and how we can answer to both? If we can listen that to Rema. From Rema. Hello, good afternoon. It's much more complicated uh, than only solving it from, from the narrative. I think that all movements around the world, especially in Latin America, we have a lot of history and a lot of information documented from the organizations, from the communities, and from a sector of the academy that support us, that demonstrates that there is a pattern of very serious violations carried out by the companies before they arrived and they started to operate during the operation time and also after they leave. There is a, a behavior that is always related to runaway processes. And of course, there is not only one mechanism in the, at the national level or at the international level that uh, assure our guarantees of space of justice because they are not only uh, soft violations. We are talking about destructions that many times leads to death of people by direct actions using through violent groups and also because of the illnesses that and diseases that are uh, detected every day in the people that live surrounding the mines. We don't have an only one question because the behavior of the companies is protected by a model that sadly we we are sure now that it was built in Canada. And this is an inheritance that we Latin American people have. And it was not only built for the uh, mining activities, but it is also uh, an inheritance for other mining companies that extract other kinds of, of metals or of minerals. And because of that, this uh, we're facing a very complex model because of the amount of impunity that is present in this model. Maybe we can reduce the protection of the companies for that. For example, uh, I can cite the constitution, the Canadian constitution, where we know that there is not only one paragraph to uh, present a, a violation of rights. And many times when we talk about violation of human rights, we are talking about uh, people that have been killed as it happened with, or, or displaced at the, as it happened with uh, people from Argentina, from La Colorada and other people that uh, from different countries. And we are always in this situation of criminalizing people, violating people and always the company is talking about social uh, corporative responsibility, especially this uh, Mr. Bidi. And how can we attack this? Uh, how can we do with this few spaces that we have with this uh, permanent violation of human rights? How can we do that? Uh, make that spaces spaces of accountability and how we can protect the communities if the violent actions are directly related with the protection of the companies. These are the issues that uh, concern us more here in Mexico and well, we don't uh, believe anymore in the international treaties because many colleagues in different countries defend these international treaties, but here in Rema, we don't believe anymore for a long time 
in the social responsibility in consultation processes because by our, by our experience, we know that these treaties are modulated by the companies so they can continue doing uh, this damage. And at the end, they will try to mitigate the damage through, uh, through compensation by money. I, I will finish with that. I would like to finish uh, this round with another question to Paul. And after that, I will pass. I will hand over to Viviane. Paul, uh, in front of so many violations of companies in Latin America, in complicity with the government, do you believe that a joint action of all the Canadian organizations that follow this uh, this problem should promote political change or what should they do if the local organizations didn't do that? I don't know if Paul can share your comments yes. about this. Thank you for the question. At the first place, I would like to say hello with solidarity to all the colleagues from Latin America talking about their testimonies and their territories. We are all in the same fight and with the same uh, issues. I think we need to use all the mechanisms possible to have incidents. The responsible action of the companies is effectively, well, the government in general in our countries is weak to face this kind of behaviors. And also our governments uh, they try to favor all the time, the investments uh, with the idea of economical benefits, but with that, they are permanently flexibilizing and reducing the environmental legislation in all the countries. And they, are, they have a huge fear to lose investments in the country. So in this sense, I think it's very important to use all the mechanisms and us as an alliance and from and from our organization in dif from different uh, regions argentina mexico ecuador who are participating in processes related to the regulations of the companies and the regulations of human rights in the framework of the United Nations. And I think that is a very important way of, of, to have more incidents. And also we need to think on the possibility of having a, a binding treaties that force the companies, not only uh, as, as principles, but as obligation to respect the standards on human rights especially in their uh, provisions changed to get sure that the suppliers in the territories respect the human rights in their totality, not only uh, the, about participation, but also a uh, right to consultation, right to a healthy environment. The experiences that are having in Switzerland and in Germany, where they are discussing the internal legislation in the uh, in the countries that force the companies to have respect in the countries where they operate, respect for the human rights and environment. And I think that it's a way that can be explored also in the case of Canadian companies. Also, are the also different the incidents uh, places we will to we should try to look for the responsibility of the companies uh, international litigation it's also a very important way that uh, showed very good results in in other cases and 
can be useful in these cases. Thank you very much for your solidarity and for your interest in the impact that the situations have in our countries. Thank you, Paul. I will remember to everyone that is hearing now that they have the option to uh, access to the interpretation and we can find it at the bottom of your screen. And to remind you that in the next hour, we will have presentations in Spanish and in company and in Portuguese. So for people that is listening us in, in uh, if you want to hear in Spanish or in English or Portuguese, go to the bottom of the screen. I will pass the word to Viviana who is coordinator of the Latin American program, My Watch Canada. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, well, yes, my name is Viviana Herrera and I am the Latin American program coordinator. I'm My Watch Canada. I am in the city of Ottawa and said the land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Thanks to all of you who are joining us right now on Facebook Live. Uh, I am hearing that we have more than 120 people in Facebook Live and also in Zoom. Thank you very much for joining us. We have people from all over the American continent, our Abia Jala from Argentina to Canada. Thank you for joining us and for joining all our panelists. I, uh, I would like to say hello to all the panelists that already spoke and to those of, that are, we will participate in the, second, in the second session. Your camera is off. Now it's on, it worked. Well, as it said before, as Chen said before, in the first part, we focus in Pan American silver, but in this second section, uh, in the second segment, we will talk about the investments of Ross Beatty in other mining companies. Because even when he is retiring tomorrow from the board of Pan American silver, he will be very present in the mining sector through other investments through two companies in particular that are Solaris Resources and Equinox Gold. So for this, we have three communities from Ecuador, Mexico, and Brazil that will talk about the impact of these companies in their territories and also about the way they resisted to these companies. And I think we can start. So we will uh, begin the section with uh, Marco Martinez. I'm just trying to overcome some technical issues, sorry. So Marco Martinez, he is the president in charge of the Shuar Aruntan people, P A. HA of the Ecuadorian Amazon, and he's also executive of the territory. The Shuar Arutam people of the Amazon in Ecuador, uh, they have been uh, resisting uh, Solaris resources and its wall wall copper mining project. The Shuar Arutam people has a strong presence over the territory. And uh, for this reason, the people have declared, declared, strong, declared strongly in many uh, occasions uh, that they don't want mining on their territory. Uh, so the Shur Arutan people say at the same time that they don't want to uh, be consulted because they feel that consultations are um, biased. So um, biased. So the. Uh, Thank you so much, Marco, for, for being with us. Uh, I would like to invite you to talk about, uh, about those statements uh, about the firm uh, opposition to uh, 
large scale mining on their territory. And also you share with us what has been the response of sellers resources to these statements by the communities against mining. Uh, so welcome Marco again, and you have the floor, you have uh, 10 minutes, uh, and I invite you to also uh, uh, talk uh, slowly to facilitate and the work of interpreters. So you have the floor. Uh, good night, everyone. To everyone who's uh, involved in this process of uh, building a uh, struggle in defense of life and uh, nature. As the uh, executive uh, of the Shwararutam people and also the uh, president in charge of the of our peoples with the I would like to say that our uh, colleague uh, Josefina has been a health strike. So uh, obviously I was asked to uh, take the lead and uh, replace her because we cannot uh, abandon those important spaces of uh, joint troubles at the national and regional and international level. I would like to share, I would like to share what we've, uh, our path uh, of our ba battle as elected representative of our communities and how to uh, maintain and protect the legacy of our peoples uh, and uh, of indigenous people in particular the Shwararutam um, people. The Shwararutam people is located in the Condor mountain range in the heart of the Samora, Congoangos and Santiago rivers. Uh, the headqu headquarters are located in Macuans, in Canton Limon y Danza, southeast of the province of Moroma, Santiago. Uh, our uh, people regroup six associations and 47 centers and almost 12,000 inhabitants. And its territorial extension is of 220,000 hectares. So 220,000 hectares that uh, compose all the Condor Cordillera. Next slide, please. So in the Peshat territory, we have uh, mining concessions. And I would like to share the following. The Warinsa mining project, Lowell Sodaris Resources S.A. is working in the Shuar Yai community in the foothills of Maka Naink in the Cordillera del Condor on PSHA territory in the headwaters and springs of the Warinsa rivers, Congo streams and springs. In August, 2016, the Shuar community of nine kids was violently evicted by the Ecuadorian state and military, militarized for large scale mining activities by the company Exa Mineral SNA that produces copper. Next slide, please. So the problems that we uh, encountered with Solaris resources are the following. The data, the meteorology supplied by Solaris resources in, the, in our territory is deception and also actions to buy conscience of the leaders with money and bribes. Second, they supposedly offer uh, free airplane service and installation of internet in the communities and also payment of $30 per day of work. Shore families are subject to psychological harassment and suffer many social problems, rape of women, alcoholism, drug addiction, 
leading to the loss of their knowledge and values because of the violations of their ancestral rights caused by the intrusion of transnational companies in the territory, which they try to disorganize with deceit and purchase of conscience, undermining our ancestral values of coexistence and replacing our ideologies with other cultures. There is total ignorance about the mechanisms and work methodologies of our government in the shore territory since they are permanently deteriorating the people who live there, as well as their customs and their quality of life. Next slide, please. There's a loss of primary forests and water pollution. Because of that, families have fewer species and fewer access to clean rivers, which increases catastrophic diseases in people and also creates pests in crops. Through concessions, the territory is being handed out to the company without content, without prior consultation, and the threats of transnational mining companies with their exploration and exploitation activities make impossible to recover its natural state and the soil does not have su sufficient capacity for recovery and come back to its original state. The soil, the land is deteriorating, deteriorating due to contamination and the Shuar people are losing their ancestral wisdom and are forced to use chemical products, which all causes a shortage of crop species. The Shuar family's own experiences show changes that affect the environment, liking the cycles of planting, harvesting and gathering food from the forest. Next slide. So at the level of the national government actions against our peoples, the national government instigates violence using public and military force to enter and take over the territories based on repression of our leaders. The government in place and of the day always has only one government plan, which is to violate the rights of the people and to guarantee impunity for transnationals and guarantee corruption, leaving the people defenseless. It's impossible to keep on mining operation. Mining shouldn't be allowed because the characteristic of projects in practice are not nature friendly and its impact on society is even worse. There is no technology to exploit copper or gold or even worse, to repair the damage. The damage is irreparable. Life should not be negotiated. They lack an alternative project for a dignified life with liberty in accordance with the cosmovision and the coexistence of the families of the territory. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the rural moment of our peoples who sustain the food sovereignty of Ecuador were discriminated against and their rights were violated. For this, re for this reason, we demand from the national government of Ecuador that there be equity and justice for all of Ecuadorians, for those who are key to Ecuador's food sovereignty. So our objective as a community and peoples is to strengthen the political orga orga organizational process of self-determination guaranteeing the autonomy of the peoples and nationalities throughout the country. We also organize Menga for the unity of the people to mobilize in the countryside and evict ex extractivist companies that are in the territory until consolidating prior free and informed consultation processes, following the overarching goal of changing the economic model with a new constituent assembly. We also look into dismantling the large scale mining concessions found in the territory of our peoples and that they be returned to the families and owners of the territory. And also we ask the national government to allocate resources for women and give credit with a minimal interest that can improve their quality of life and their economy. 
we add the inter inter intervention of human rights and international defense organizations, since the rights of the leaders are being threatened. At the level of legal actions, Following the mandate of the Shuar Aritan people and the political constitution of Ecuador, Article 98, our people has been carrying out resistance, resistance, sit-ins and marches in rejection of large-scale mining, oil logging and hydroelectric activities. In coordination with the representatives of the nationalities at national and international levels, such as COICA, CONAI, CONFENAI, and interfederaciones, we hold press conferences in different local, national, and international media venues in rejection of the mining activities in, on our territory. Based on the fact that the national government has violated Article 66, 56, and 57, Paragraph 7 of the Political Constitution of Ecuador on the prior free and informed consultation, about any activities to be developed on the territory, the Shuar Aritan people have already decided no to large scale mining and we do not want to be consulted. This is our slogan. We want to expel large scale mining companies that are infiltrating the communities of the Shuar Aritan people's territory, violating the, our people's life land. We also are driving uh, legal cause campaign. Since uh, on September 24, 2019, the Shuar Aritan people held a press conference at the Konai Quito headquarters with representatives of the nationalities of the Amazon, Coca, Konai, and Confinai in rejection of mining activity in the territory. On November 23, 2020, our peoples initiated a legal cause campaign against the national government for non-compliance with Convention 169, Article 24 on indigenous and tribal peoples in independent countries in relation to the implementation of a wire INSA mining project. So this has been in practice, our process and the process that we've been uh, leading as uh, elected uh, authorities in, on our territory in representation of the 27 communities of Shuar uh, and protecting the territory of the El Condor Cordillera. Thank you so much for having uh, listened, for listening to me. And we are still here. Uh, firmly with, uh, uh, with you all. Uh, we hope we'll uh, keep the linkages all together to uh, build uh, joint criteria to also uh, battle together. And I'm open for all questions. Thank you so much, uh, Marco. Uh, we certainly will have questions for you and we'll share them to you uh, towards the end of the three uh, presentations. Thanks a lot. So now let's continue with the Ejido of Carizarillo in the state of Guerrero in Mexico, who are going to tell us about Equinox Gold and the damage caused by their Los Filos project. It is important to know that the Los Filos mine started in 2008 when it belonged to the Canadian mining company Gold Corp. Equinox Gold acquired this mine in, in March 2020 not too long ago. However, in less than six months, the relationship with the Ejido has deteriorated so much that a strike began on September 3 of the same year. So the community was forced to start a strike. And this strike turned out to be the longest that has happened since the beginning of this project. The Carizalillo Ejido, or Common Land Ejido, denounced the company for non-compliance of their agreement on social cooperation and for being also racist and discriminatory towards the communities. Despite having signed a new agreement, the conflict goes on. 
the Ejido, the common land, has recorded its presentation last week, but is present along with members of the Mexican network of people affected by mining, mining the REMA network. Uh, they are here to participate during the Q&A and respond to your questions. So, Anna, Nico, we can start uh, the video they recorded for us. We're not listening, uh, Edna or Nico. The ejido of uh, Carizalillo is a uh, nejido or common land with more than 100 years old, which has been dedicated to uh, agriculture, planting corn, beans, pumpkin. It's also a region where we produce mezcal, a delicious mezcal, which has been a very important part of its economy. A large part of the community has been dedicated uh, to cattle ranching, livestock, which has now been totally modified because the company, out of the 100% of uh, Carrizalillo's Ejido territory, 80% is occupied by mining activity. A large part of the mining activity, blocks, mines, yards, offices, are located within the Carrizalillo Ejido. It represents most of it. It has implied a great loss, conducing to health contamination, leading to many complications for people, for children, that's so that it would take me a whole day or more to give examples. But those cases are well documented. There's the company follows a system. Well, it's not paying attention to the, the to the issue. It is not paying attention to what affects people. It is simply focusing on its mining operation and is not focusing on the impact that the exploitation of minerals is causing. It is important for the EHIDO, the non-compliance of the company in disagreement, because uh, we are demanding something that was already agreed relating fundamentally to the water issue. Since 2019, this was agreed with the company. They did not pay attention to it. They only carried out a study, but the results were never presented. On the health issue, they were, they have been delivering medicine to the Ejido. This was already something agreed upon, but they manipulated the prices exaggeratedly so. At the scholarship level, they did not pay the full amount of the scholarships. At the employment level, there was always a dispute because they are not complying. No respect from Juan Carlos, who was at the time the community development manager. There was a constant lack of attention to the employment problem. The Ejido never had anything additional to it, what had been agreed. But the problem was that the attention given by the company was that it wanted to negotiate on something already agreed between the parties. Since before the break with the company, which led to the mobilization that blocked the company's mining activities, there was a search on the part of the Homeland to try to find a conciliatory way with the company 
to resolve the non-compliance. And from then on, on July 31, uh, then on September 2, and all the meetings we held with Peter Burgers, we faced a racist discriminatory attitude, which I believe was the main reason why the common land container discrimination, racism, and lack of attention, not wanting to give a solution to this. And themselves, the company, they caused a situation that became more complicated because every time we had a meeting, even during the strike, they showed this unacceptable racism, discrimination, lack of attention, and adopting an attitude that could have been avoided from the beginning. The lack of attention showed in every meeting their racist attitude, answering in a rude way, not giving attention to the assembly, disseminating false informative documents within the movement, within the community, with the intention of breaking our assembly. Putting pressure from the government, the army and the state prosecutor who showed up and they all showed up in a very intimidating way at meetings where they were uh, being attended by people and families and the elders who shouldn't have been subjected to those kind of doings. Those people only wanted to put pressure on the movement and this happened constantly in every meeting. Dr. Georgina Blanco lied she said she was going to meet, never showed up or came when she at any time. And when on site, she always introduced herself in a rude manner. She did not pay attention. She always treated us like the same way as Peter Berger. Uh, she discriminated against the community. She did not accept that the community is a group of interest that must be taken care of because the community is part of the business. And she continued to act this way, which the day of the signing of the agreement, we invited her to end this conflict and this type of actions, to which she responded that she did not care. She said that the common land may do what they want and I will do what I want, affirming that the common land had to assume the responsibility and pay, pay for the damages. And that's the situation and it's gone on. There is still a conflict. There is a legal problem before the Agrarian Unitary Court where the common land is being sued for several million pesos. The land has to defend itself and it will defend itself. The community will present all its arguments and of course the process will further complicate the relationship and the future business that the company says it wants. So um, I believe uh, there's no there's no reason to jump around with joy because this conflict still exists. It's still on, well alive, and they did they didn't want to desist from their lawsuit. They continue with the intention of making the common land responsible for their losses, which they themselves caused by not complying with the joint agreement. Now they want to make the community to be responsible and the community will not agree with this and will never agree because it was a matter of lack of attention and respect to the agreement that was signed. If the community lost this legal battle, they have no future, they might have no future because the community would not rent anymore. It would not rent to such a, a company. It would not rent to Equinox Gold in three years. They want to impose their will and do their activities again 
by force with a bad intention, but this has an expiration date, which is three years, because in three years, the community recovered plans and will decide whether to rent or not to rent. And the company will have to stand still. It will not be able to recover its millions simply because of lack of, a, lack of attention, because they are racist, because they want to discriminate and they want to subjugate a community. They have never understood that the community are partners. We are partners, even if it's not in a situation of equity, but it should be in respect, giving attention to its claims and needs. Well, many thanks uh, to the comrades from the community of Carrizalillo. As I said before, they will be joining us at the end after the presentation that we are having in a few minutes for the question and answers round. Uh, well, we will kick off the last presentation of tonight. But before that, I would like to say that this presentation will be in Portuguese. So I would like to remind you, uh, I would to make sure uh, that the instructions are here. The people that are in Zoom and are listening in Spanish, please be sure that below you choose the interpretation channel in Spanish so that you can listen to the presentation in Spanish. Below in the screen, you will see a icon, an icon of a globe and there you can choose Spanish. So here we go. As I was saying, uh, we have in this moment, uh, Donia Espinheiro. I hope I am pronouncing it well. Uh, Donia is uh, welcome. He is a member of the Arizona community. Uh, together with his community of more than 4,000 people that will be affected by a spill that occurred recently at the Arizona mine, property of Equinox Gold. Uh, this is very recent. It happens on March 25, uh, about 45 years, days ago. Since then, we have seen uh, videos circulated by the movement uh, that are very impressive where they show, uh, it, it's impressive to see the spill, the water that it's orange, uh, and that's the water that the people are drinking. We can see in the videos too and the pictures that have been circulating since then, that people and family are suffering itches in their skins, especially children, and also a video that shows how the people is mobilizing, protesting, and demanding their rights to water, um, uh, being attacked for demanding that rights. Johnny Ice is here, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. I know it's a little late in Brazil. I would like to ask you to tell us a little more about the current situation of the communities and what has been the response from Equinox Gold uh, in the face of such a spill and such a disaster. Also, if you can comment us about the relation uh, of this company with the communities since they started operating the mining territories. Johnny Ice, welcome. Please, I ask you to speak slowly since uh, we will be translating from Portuguese to Spanish and then from Spanish to Portuguese. So please, thank you again. We are listening to you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonias from the community of uh, Arizona in Maranhão community. Good evening to everyone that is attending the meeting today. We live here in the northern part of Maranhão, and we are suffering many uh, 
problems because of the actions of Equinox Gold in uh, the community of Arizona. We've uh, faced many uh, difficult situations. High rate of poverty. It is, uh, we have a lot of gratitude to be part of this panel and this uh, today's meeting because uh, it is a space where we are sharing our experience that we've heard that is similar to other situation in the continent. As you can see in the photos and in the videos, those companies are only thinking about profits. They don't uh, think about human life and biodiversity. Uh, 45 days ago, there was uh, a rupture of the dam, a secondary dam that were, is managed by Echinus Gold. And you can see the impact here in the video. So that dam broke and uh, harmed the hold the reserve of waters. And this reserve of water is uh, uh, feeds into our uh, Arizona community. So the rupture of the dam, uh, we are facing this problem of uh, water security. And obviously the company sends out press releases to convince the society that everything has come back to normal. But in fact, uh, we are still suffering the impact. We have a commission of many people here, uh, people of the mob uh, movement, the movement of uh, people against companies and comp against dams, and they are persecuted. They, because that's uh, the way the companies are acting against any activists that fight for the right to water. Because of course, without water, we cannot live. This, uh, this photo shows the basin that was affected by the overflow of the dam. And the bottom part of the picture, you can see the part of the, the part of the dam that was uh, broke. The, uh, the mine is using many toxic substances, cyanur, cadmium. So since the beginning of uh, the operations of the mining and its arrival in our people's territory, we've uh, we have been presented as if the mining was uh, contributing to the development, but the benefits are not for our people, for the community. We lack still infrastructure of water or even asphalted roads, access to our territory. And as people, we don't have a clear form of communication in our territory. And like Marco Martinez said a few minutes ago, like you can see in our photo, in the picture, we live uh, very far away uh, in our people, in our village. We don't have paved roads. We are confronting the governors, the police, all decision makers. And we are requesting them services because we're living in the middle of a context of physical violence. And like I always say, because the mining company comes and then goes away. And then the community is left with no jobs, no income for the families. And the situation perjures over time, facing complex situations, poverty, and when the 
mining company is going away, we're left with nothing. The jobs are difficult. Employment is lacking in, in our communities, on our territory. Uh, and the company only hires qualified labor force, workforce. Uh, and here you see, can see a sign of the company, everything, many activities. Uh, they even uh, displaced us from our territory. They uh, prohibit us to fish, to hunt, or even bathe in the river. And they are accompanied by the armed forces and the police forces to implement their actions on the ground. Uh, the mining company never offers anything. They always prom promise that they will implement services, but there's nothing concrete on the ground offered to the communities. And until now, there's no solutions. We're facing a dead road. The mining companies, they try to convince everyone that they have a fantastic model of action, of activities. Look at how the water comes out of the tap in our house, in our homes. This is uh, a water source that comes to the tap in our homes. This water provokes many disease to our people, to our children. And of, of course, the company doesn't respond. We uh, develop many strategies, we collect water, and you see here the impact on, on our children. They are the most vulnerable. There's no other way to give them a bath than using that dark water that comes out of our tap. And we, we're facing a dead and no solutions. We are trying to request and present ourselves in the face of many institutions, agencies, at the level of the village government, but there's no solution offered to us of the impact and the harms provoked by the company. What we see uh, here is a case in point to what, what's happening here, but also in many parts of the world, they show nice things that their activities are sustainable, but that's not the truth. We are struggling against that company. Uh, uh, it's been eight years now that we have been battling, but uh, more intensely, uh, it started four years ago, doing organizing protests, demanding the respect of our rights. That's that's what we are trying to achieve, reclaiming our rights. But we are persecuted. We are being attacked by the company, the Arizona communities, we felt threatened by the situation. It, 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 they're trying to turn the situation around that we are the ones that are attacking, but we are the victims. They try to uh, turn the situation around and present that we are the criminals. We are criminalizing, that's the truth because beyond the environmental destruction, there's a personal destruction because the community, our peoples are the ones that are paying the price of everything that's happening here in our communities. We are living We are living in a, in in a context where we don't find any solutions. We don't know when we'll have a solution for our water. We don't know how the water will be at when the company leaves. We don't have a clear certainty what will happen to us, to our natural resources. I hope uh, you are listening to me and, and understand that we are, are already facing a dead end this kind of meeting that we are holding today is, is key. 
so that the whole world can hear the situation that we are facing because of the activities of Echinus's Equinox Gold, what we're going through in our Arizona community. Rose BT is the main investor of that company. And maybe that's a question I would, would like to raise uh, among everyone who's listening and participating to this event. In fact, uh, Ross Beatty is, is, is presenting himself as a philanthrop, but how can it be when he only favors destruction for our peoples and the environment that spreads around the misery for our people? That's a question I'm trying to send out to all of you. And maybe that you could take and ask Ross Beatty. He's trying to build this image, but that's absurd. The real image that he should have is the one that you're seeing in my presentation. The people are going through fear, terror. They don't know what to do. And after so many years of battle, we are not, we are against, not, not the mining itself, but the bad things, their impact. The, the economic activity should bring benefits to the community and to the Brazilian society. Why are they fostering bad impacts? There should be a way to do a good mining or not when they arrive, they all steal away all the natural resources and don't leave anything in the hands of the community. Really, I want to say and reiterate, I'm very happy to be in, on behalf of our community to be part of this event, to be able to share and voice out our what we're facing and uh, the environment is what is left for our next generations and the impacts are terrible for us. We are battling for the common good, not only for our common good, but also for the whole society, but for also for our children, the next generations. Today, we need to struggle battle together because tomorrow is uncertain and we have to build together the future, our future. I know the battle is difficult, but I know that a better future is not impossible. Thank you so much for allowing us, inviting us to participate in this event. I hope everyone is still awake and I'm, I'm here to respond to all questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Johnny Ice. Thank you for your words and what you were telling at the beginning, asking the question to Ross Beatty and Echinus Gold and to transmit them the demands. Uh, it takes me to think, to talk about what uh, Jen said at the beginning of this forum. And it's to ask to all the participants and to all the people that is watching us now, is to uh, uh, making echo of this uh, of the demands of the communities that share today uh, with us, and a way to doing that is this call to action uh, that we are proposing that tomorrow, as we said, is the natural. So we should move the social network to send messages to Ross Beatty, to the people that is, to send her messages to remind her what's the toxic history of Pan American silver in all Latin. And also take action. 
on the cases of Equinox Gold and Solaris resources. On Solaris, what we can do, there's a petition online that has been created and promoted with uh, many allies, uh, including Amazon Watch. Uh, uh, we'll send all those um, lines of action uh, through email. And, and that's uh, the kind of action that you can take to support the Shwarayutam Shua people and, and, and to ask for the respect of their response to mining, which is a clear no. When you follow the link that we've shared also and dropped in the chat box, there's also a, an email that you can use to uh, contact us. And so we can, or you can use that uh, email to uh, direct yourself to the company. Th those are the kind of uh, actions that we can do uh, in many uh, countries in Canada and uh, have a strong advocacy and all uh, our partners in many communities, indigenous communities, uh, I've said, and we heard it today, they don't allow them to talk about their, the problems they're facing. There's no space for them. So, and of course uh, their demands don't arrive, don't land in the good hands. So that's why our international solidarity and joint action can help them to make their voice being heard. So we have now um, a period of questions. And there's a question here to uh, Marco, to Shorarutem. Uh, what recommendations, what do you recommend to the Canadian society and civil society, how we can uh, strengthen the solidarity linkages with you? How can we uh, show solidarity with your battle? Uh, Marco, what do you think? Well, in this case, we as a government, government authority in, uh, uh, here in Shwara Rutam people, we mentioned that the state of Ecuador is an accomplice, is responsible of any intru intrusion on our territory. That's why I'd like to, to share that as owners of the territory, we don't recognize any agent that intrudes on our territory and that supposedly would bring development and parameters. And we can observe that the Ecuadorian state is an accomplice in all this. We are saying basta, enough. We are autonomous on our land. The mining, which is a transnational, has to accept, accept our presence as indigenous people. We are managing the territory. Civilized society should act in dialogue. But we're facing governments that supposedly talk about democracy. They talk about liberty, freedom. But they are the first ones in not respecting norms, standards, and laws uh, that from our standpoint, from our own right, we said stop to all those government projects, all mining projects, oil projects that in fact don't bring development to our families, to our peoples, since was created the Republic, the Shuar people subsisted. We, we are not taken into account by the government and more or less so by the transnational companies that intrude our territories. We have tried 
we have used different channels and we have also bridged with solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters in the continent and worldwide and because we all need together to defend our rights of our people of our families a respect to our ways of life we are a people of peace and we want peace we have a territory that is defined and lives in peace they are part of a territories of life as we say and so that's why we denounce the state the government that attracts the transnationals that should stand firmly and say to the transnational companies go away and go away from the indigenous territories you are not welcome thank you so much marco thank you viviana thanks to you maybe a question for rema network in mexico how can we uh, establish solidarity links from uh, communities in canada and other regions with the communities in mexico and also maybe you can talk about and there's a question here that was raised i know there's not much time but uh, if you can talk briefly what has what has been the resisting process and in the community of uh, Carasquillo and and how it has inspired other uh, focal points of resistance in Mexico can you share that a little bit thank you Uh, are people from Rema in Mexico there? Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes, uh, first of all, the, the issue of accountability uh, by uh, the companies is something that is pending. Uh, there are many uh, projects uh, in, in some countries uh, to uh, to ask for accountability, but they on the ground they're still violating the rights of uh, communities. Uh, they even have built some uh, mining corridors that go across our territory that affect uh, that are not only local but are regional. They don't only uh, affect one river but a whole basin. In uh, the, this case the environmental laws in many countries are very are too laxist about uh, the impact those activities are having on the ground in our country and in many cases there are no there's no transparency on those activities like the canadian mining companies uh, and uh, sometimes uh, we are not able to uh, share the information that we are facing uh, in those spaces international uh, level and that's why we need to use those mechanisms and strengthen those mechanisms to bring that information at the higher level in those countries uh, what impacts the communities and how the projects are violating uh, the community's rights uh, which is the case in mexico of uh, the red chilisto uh, community uh one mechanism is uh, letters uh and and confront the those projects of expansion of those mining concessions uh, how the community of carasquillo has been strengthening their battle in hand in hand with other communities well it's a community that really uh, observe many affectations to uh to the territory on the environment on the women and men of the communities. For those communities, they are being uh, threatened by many uh, mining projects. Uh, maybe uh, Carista, uh, Cariscalillo mining project is like a laboratory, like um, very emblematic. Uh, it's being developed uh, with a high level of uh, violence. Uh, 
uh, with a presence of uh, that transnational that violates people's rights and the territory. So how it has inspired other communities in Mexico in the case if they are implementing similar projects in other regions, uh, what we're trying to uh, foster is share tools and uh, identify different mechanism of uh, prevention to uh, prevent those companies to uh, intrude in, in their uh, territory and prohibit the installation of those kind uh, of projects in complicity with the government and, and try to prevent uh, the arrival of all those companies, uh, so we don't are not facing their impact and their affectations on the territory and the communities. Thank you so much. Uh, I see there's another question uh, directed to you uh, related to solidarity. In the in the case of the overflow and uh, dam break in uh, Arizona community, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, communication strategies that in Canada, and there was an effort to really talk about what was really happening on the ground in Brazil. So the question is, what do you think about those kind of strategies? And, and, and what can we do for the lack of visibility of what's happening on the ground in Brazil as it relates to Canadian companies, in that case, uh, to the Equinox company, what would you recommend to the Canadian society so they claim for accountability? Janais, the floor is yours. Hi there again. So we have uh, media strategies. Uh, we thank uh, also the MAP movement that were able to uh, have a national re repercussion impact and then uh, at the international level. The MAP movement is uh, able to uh, disseminate what's happening on the ground here to us. We are uh, also working uh, closely with other entities. But we we saw that the uh, media has uh, denied that uh, there was a rupture of the dam, a, a breakdown, and they're falsifying the reality. we we want to make sure that the information arrives uh, to canada and, and get, gets disseminated throughout the world and I, if we are achieving this it's thanks to our allies with ngos with the map movement and the uh, anti-dam movement uh, the map is 30, year, 30 years old and thanks to their longevity, they have been able to have access to medias and put on the media space the issue that's happening to, to us. The MAB has been very helpful, but we, if we'd have more allies like you attending today's meeting, if you can help us disseminating the problems we're facing, that would be so much easier to create a global vision, a world vision of uh, what's happening at the local level in the community of Arizona. The mainstream media said there was something small, just an overflow of the dam, but it was not a simple overflow. Uh, it was a total rupture and total breakdown of the dam. In fact, the mining companies uh, sent out false press release releases saying it was only a small overflow. And until today, they're saying it's a small problem. No, it was a grave breakdown of the dam. Even at the beginning, they were saying it was like a millennial 
rain flow coming from the sky, something natural. And that's what the mainstream media uh, took as the first news. But if we can develop different channels of communication and information dissemination through you, for example, that would be fantastic. And now you have our contacts. We've created those linkages. We want to have those kind of valleys like you all to develop joint actions. Uh, and from the distance, you can uh, be part of the struggle. Uh, and we are doing the possible to uh, make this uh, situation visible and we'd like your support. In reality, when we act against a transnational company, we are facing powerful actors. And from our point of view, we always say here that we are a street dog fighting against a pit bull because a mining company uh, is very powerful uh, when they own 10 to 50,000 hectares and how they benefit from the, the natural resources they without no overview they have so much benefits they have so much power their benefits are incredible here in our national currency in reality and and like you just said we'd really be happy to strengthen our link Thanks, so Johnny we can I. act together and yes i think we should be uh, allies and we should divulgate your demands thanks for your work Johnny. Yes. So to finish, I would like to remind all people that is look is watching us and that join us during this event. Uh, please to take action, uh, take action in the social network. Let's make noise. Uh, let's echo the demands of the communities. As I would like to uh, say again that you will receive an email with all the messages and also with what you are seeing in the screen now with all the information of the social networks of each one of the communities that presented today. So you can follow them and not only today or tomorrow echo their demands, but from now forever, you can do this. Thank you very much to the panelists. Again, thanks to all of you. Thanks to everyone for sharing their histories with us and for giving us the, this view of the situation of the mining of the Canadian mining companies in Latin America. Thank you very much for this. And just to finish, I would like to uh, thank uh, to our interpreters, Pierre Eves, uh, Serinette, Patricia Pozzagut, and Ellen Anders. Thank you very much for this beautiful world that is very hard, thanks to the three of you. And I would also like to thank to Edna and Nico uh, that for their technical support. Thank you very much to the both of you for your time and dedication and to be sure to everyone to get good. And to finish, I would like to thank to all the organizations that supported us uh, promoting this event. Uh, the organizations from the United States and from Canada, thank you very much for your sponsorship for this event. And that would be all for now. Thank you very much to everyone and good night.